you have your Bibles, go with me to Luke chapter 10. That's where we're going to be uh, today. I thought I'd just start off, uh, since you don't know me, some of you know me, just share my testimony really quickly, um, and then talk a little bit about my family real quick, then we'll get into God's Word. Um, so I was born and raised in the great state of California. Thank you very much. Right, right. Uh, I'm from Northern California, from the North Bay, a little town called Santa Rosa. I got family in SoCal, but where I was born and raised was in NorCal, and uh, love it there. Let me say one thing. Yeah, go for it. Oh, Tom, that's going to be really hard. <clears throat> okay, I'll try to grip here. I'm a roamer by nature, so I will do my best so that you don't have to do as much work. Um, just briefly about me, everybody's testimony. Um, sometimes you hear people say, I've got a really boring testimony, and so they're, you know, whatever. You know, all of the testimonies that we give should speak of the grace and glory of God, and so... Um, I would love to know your story. I will be around for a few hours after today. If you want to come and talk, I'd love to talk to you, hear your story. My story, I'll just give it to you really brief. Uh, my parents were headed to divorce at the ages of 19 and 18. Um, and uh, they went and got some counseling from a pastor who shared the gospel with them. God saved them and then God saved their marriage. And from the time I was born all the way through, I was born into the church, you might say. But I understood the gospel at the age of four, actually. I understood my sin. I remember feeling massive conviction about my, my sin at the age of four and uh, received the gospel at four. Um, we have a family business, very successful business. I, as the only son, it was being offered to me. But at the age of, of 20, I felt God's call in my life to go into full-time ministry. So I packed up my bags and I left college and I went to Bible college. I was trained for ministry. And there it was God did a, a massive work on my heart. Um, the first full week of missions conference was a pastor from Utah who came and shared about Mormonism. I had two friends growing up in California who were Christians who were also LDS. And when I understood their gospel and I understood our gospel, God began to do a work in my heart. And he then called me to Utah into church planting. So we officially launched our church in 1997. It's about an hour north of here, a place called Springville. It's in Utah County, or some people call it Happy Valley. Yeah, anyway. Um, and uh, we left in 2010. We, speaking my wife and my kids, I had, have five kids. Britt, you wanna, oh, there, there's my family. You gotta look at my, my ugly mug the whole time, but um, here's my family. So you have my wife over on the left there, and those are my five kids. So I'll, I'll point to them real quick here. We have Mark, and we have Kobe, we have Gloria, Landon, and Riley. And uh, the ages of my kids are 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Just all see you. Right? Right? It's the water in Utah. I'm telling you guys. It's the water in Utah. So all my kids were born here. Um, Mark, he's 20. Um, he's going into missions. He wants to work in orphan care and vulnerable children is his degree. Uh, Kobe next to him is 19. Uh, he goes to Snow College right here, and uh, he interned this last year with Tri Grace. He'll be coming back for his sophomore year. In the middle is my daughter. She turned 16 yesterday. Uh, next to her is Landon. He's 18. He shipped off to boot camp for the Air Force yesterday, so I cried all day yesterday on my, uh, my daughter's birthday, so hopefully she'll forgive me for that. And then you have Riley. She's 17. She's working in northern Utah at her grandparents' uh, natural food store that just opened this last summer. And so those are my kids, and that's my family. Um, so anyway, uh, here I am. What, what happened since, since uh, Colorado? I went to Colorado in 2010. I burned out of ministry in 2013. A lot of things that go into that. Uh, but in 2015, um, we launched a ministry, and the ministry that I'm involved with now, we essentially we pour our ministry in our lives into pastors and wives. That's our focus, is pastoral culture. So some people are involved in the ministry, you might say, of preparation. 
Bible colleges and seminaries, we say we're in the ministry of preservation. Because when you look at the statistics, here's a statistic for you. After five years of graduating from Bible college and seminary, 50% of people who are intending to go into a lifelong career of ministry are out for good. And many of those are leaving the faith. And uh, there's a guy on my advisory board who's writing a book on pastoral burnout. And it's a subject that we do not talk about in the church, but it's a reality. It's a real reality. And so um, after burning out and God restoring me outside of Las Vegas, Nevada, of all places, Sin City, we now have a ministry where we actually open up our guest house. And this last year so far, we've had 13 pastoral couples that we've poured into and we, we're doing other things as well. So that's the ministry I'm, I'm a part of. Um, okay, so, sorry, Tom, I keep moving around. I'll, I'll try not to very much. Um, I brought a scale with me, and this idea came to me at 3.20 this morning or something like that. And I'm asking you to remind me of this illustration at the end because it's not in my notes, and it came to me at like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I don't know how well you function at 3. I don't function. So, um, so somebody can just yell scale or something like that at the end if I haven't mentioned it, and we'll go from there. Okay. If you want to talk afterwards, love to talk to you, but let's get into God's word right now and uh, let's pray and ask God to speak to our hearts. Father, thank you so much for your word and I thank you for every single person that's here, Lord, sacrificing their time and really in many ways, Lord, um, sacrificing being comfortable and I praise you for that, that they're up off the couch and that they are involved in something so important and that's sharing the gospel. Lord, I pray for every single conversation that happens today. Lord, I pray that they would approach those conversations with great humility. God, I pray that you would empower them with incredible discernment. And Lord, as they share the truth of your word, I pray that it would be seen just your love in and through them. As we get into your word now, God, I pray that your spirit would speak to each individual heart. Lord, help us not to think about people around us or other things. I pray, Lord, that we'd really be focused on what you want to talk to us about this morning in accordance with sharing the gospel in this area. And that's what's really, really important to you. We want to know your heart. Lord, what an awesome thing to know the God of this universe and to be known by you. But Lord, this morning, reveal a little bit of your heart to us this morning so that we can properly and powerfully represent you and the gospel. And so we want to give you freedom in our hearts today to rule and to reign. If there's sin, Lord, help us to confess that, to make that right. We pray your blessing upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 10. I'm going to ask you to stand with me in honor of God's word. We're just going to read a few short verses, 38 through 42. I'm reading out of the NASB, and this is what it reads. Now, as they were traveling along... He entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word seated at his feet. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha... Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are necessary, really only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Thank you. You guys can be seated. All right, here's the title of my message, and it's this. What's most important to Jesus? Now, as we go through this, you may say, I don't know about that. That's okay. We're going to hone in on, on what I feel a Jesus is really wanting to get across to us. Last year, Chip had me come and talk about evangelism and uh, had a great time with that message. And as I began to pray about what to bring you guys, God overwhelmingly brought me to this passage. And I really believe this is what God wants us to talk about. And so it's actually before you get to the evangelism part. Okay. And uh, we'll see what God will say to you. As we come to this story in the context, it's kind of interesting. Jesus had just got done sharing with an expert in religious law what is truly meant to love your neighbor as yourself. Does anybody know what that preceding story is? Anybody? Good Samaritan. Yeah, excellent. Good Samaritan. 
And, you know, the disciples, I'm sure, were amazed at the story of the Good Samaritan. And so Jesus wants to, I believe, concentrate his efforts on revealing to the disciples what the single most important thing that we would give them the, that would give them the ability to actually love others as Christ has called us to. Um, when I was a, pastoring a church, I was involved in a ton of different kinds of ministries. And I found myself very, very busy. And uh, as I began to pray about this story, I found myself um, really relating to Martha. It says in verse 40, and we're going to go through verse by verse, but it says, But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. As we get into this, I, I, I want you to understand I've been praying for your time here. Okay? And you guys have had probably a ton of preparation. Perhaps some of you have been doing some classes, doing different things to prepare, maybe raising some funds. You know, you, you're getting the gospel down, all these preparations. And sometimes I find in ministry, we can just simply be distracted by ministry. And I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. He's a pastor and a counselor in California. And uh, he said something to me very interesting. He was the one that actually counseled me. And, and part of the reason that I burned out, just to be very transparent, was I was so involved in ministry that I, I, for some reason, I wasn't spending adequate time with the one who I was ministering for. Okay? I was substituting at times in my ministry, I was substituting my own personal quiet to be still and know that I'm God time in preparation because I was distracted with so many things. I think my heart was good, but I was just overcome with all the things that I was doing. I church planted in Utah. I was also bivocational. And so for about 10 years, I was building homes on the side. Okay, On the side, I was building homes and I was also pastoring a church. I was involved in camping ministry, speaking in conferences. I was a chaplain in the Angels organization in baseball. I had my marriage. I had my five kids. And the list could go on and on. And I was busy. And sometimes in ministry, it's almost a brag that we can talk about how busy we are, how distracted we are. Um, it's a very good thing, you guys, to serve the church of Jesus or to go on a missions trip or to teach a Bible study. Um, but when we get looking at this uh, story today, um, there's some things that I want you to ponder. Because if we're not careful and we become distracted, it's an avenue, I believe, for Satan to get just a little bit into our lives. And what we see is we see a Martha attitude come out. And in your notes there, you'll probably look and see what kind of attitudes can come. Okay? So let's begin in verses 38 and 39 again. Let's look at the diversity of perspective, disciple before duty. Verses 38 and 39 again, it reads, Now as they were traveling along, he entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word, seated at his feet. Now, just track with me for a second. I'm imagining a little bit here, but Jesus and the disciples, they're on their way for a meet and greet, you might say, at Martha's house and Mary's house. And uh, they're on their way. And, and I believe this may have been the first time that Jesus actually met with them. And uh, it indicates that uh, Martha was the hostess of her home. And we don't really know. The text reads this, and a woman named Martha welcomed him. And so you have these two different perspectives. You have one, you have the Martha perspective in verse 38, and you have the Mary perspective in verse 39. And what I want you to think about is what perspective might I have as I serve Jesus, okay? In 38, we find that Martha welcomes Jesus, the disciples, he, she welcomes them at the door. Now, that's a good thing. Now, I know this may not be true here, but I'm just going to say on record here, let's just say that she has the gift of hospitality, okay? Serving, okay? Very important to note that Jesus was welcomed because almost everywhere he went, he wasn't exactly welcomed, right? But here he's welcomed. He's welcomed. And I believe he was greeted this way because they believed who he claimed to be. He was the Messiah. Okay, so he was welcomed in verse 38. Good thing. Verse 39. Again, 
It says that Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word, seated at his feet. It states that Mary sat at the Lord's feet as he taught her and the disciples. And what they were recounting, I don't know. It could have been the story of the Good Samaritan. I believe if you're sitting at someone's feet like like was done right here, she was excited to, to, to know who Jesus was and what he had planned. What were his plans? And they were getting to know one another. And here in your notes, it's this point that I want to make. Jesus is much more concerned about us becoming his disciples than he is about us being obsessed with fulfilling his duties. And that is a relationship, you guys. That's where it is. And I've talked to a lot of people who serve and they serve and they serve and sometimes they feel burned out in service and it's because oftentimes there's a lack of relationship, a lack of relationship. And yet here we find her at the Lord's feet, just in conversation, listening, learning, being taught. Verse 40, it says this, but Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him, speaking of Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. I don't know if that was the inflection, but you know, I'm thinking to myself, we've got a tense situation here. You know, we're all gathered around, nice fellowship time, and here comes Martha, distracted with all her preparations, and Martha's got an attitude problem. Well, that's kind of how I read into it, but here you have a woman who's very hospitable, I believe. I think she's a hard worker, and yet she was distracted with all her preparations. That word distracted means this, to be pulled or dragged away. Have you guys ever been involved, maybe in ministry or serving in some way, where you just, you are overwhelmed, you are distracted by all your preparations, and at times, it has dictated your your attitude relationally. Oh, sorry, Tom. I'll stay right here. Um, It has dictated your relationships. It's, It's distracted you from relationship. I'll give you an example. When I was pastoring a church, I was known, and I had a, a, a dear older woman pull me aside in my youth as a pastor, and she reamed me a new one, and I deserved it. But oftentimes what would happen is, in the morning, we would get there a couple hours early. It was in our early days. We were setting up. We'd tear down. And I have a million things going through my mind, and I'm directing people, and I'm serving as well. And she came up, and she, I think, well, this is what she said. She asked me how I was doing. I guess I totally blew her off. I don't know because I don't remember this, but she let me know later on that I did this. And I just kept going with my, I was distracted with my preparations. She pulled me aside and told me how much that hurt her feelings and she felt like I didn't care. Now let me tell you something, I absolutely cared, but I was distracted and it hurt her feelings. Then I had the privilege of humbling myself and apologizing. Even though I was busy doing ministry, I really wasn't doing ministry and it hurt her feelings. And so that's what happened. Um, She, speaking of Martha, was pulled away from the priority here where you have Mary listening and learning God's word. Now, spiritual gifts are given to those within the church so that the church can be edified. We equip for ministry so that can happen. But in this story, we even find Martha, she's involved, you might say, in hospitality or spiritual service. But that may not necessarily be the most important thing to even Jesus right here. And so now we find Martha all hyped up. And just imagine listening to Jesus and then all of a sudden, Lord, do you not care that my sis... I mean, some women have real attitude. (laughs) Do you not care that that my sister has left me to do all the serving, right? Can you see it? Oh, man. Can you imagine the disciples just going, shut up, don't say anything, just let her go off. You know, right? You don't want to intercept a woman in her rage, you know? So I'm just thinking to myself, this is a, one of those moments where after she gets out her anger, you can just hear a pin drop because no one wants to say anything at that moment, right? I mean, that's kind of the picture. Then, then she says at the end, then tell her to help me. She's telling Jesus, what's up? I'm guilty as well, by the way, at times in my life. But the audacity of that 
shows me a full-on flesh-out moment here. She's all hyped up. She is so focused on her service that she becomes completely irate with her lazy sister. That's the scene right here. That's the scene right here. Now, I will admit to you, I'm I'm admitting that I'm a sinner right before you. This is very humbling. Um, So we have five kids. And, you know, through the years of five teenagers in the home, believe it or not, we go through some food. I got three boys. Uh, The picture's not up. They can eat. I'm telling you what. They can put it down. And the amount of dishes that we go through, we run like through like three or four cycles a day when our family's together. That shot that you saw was in early May. That was the last time my family was together. And we probably won't be together as a family for, for many years. But, but not long ago, we would have three or four cycles of dishes a day and they'd just be piling up. And I'm type A. I'm kind of, I don't know, I like things in order. And so I'd walk by the kitchen. I'd walk by the kitchen and there'd be just dishes coming out everywhere. And in my household, it's like, if you see it, you should do it kind of a thing. And the funny thing is, is the kitchen is by all of their bedrooms. So I'm thinking, how is this getting by everybody, right? So at times at night, I would be doing dishes, but I'd be clanking them as hard as I can <laughs> in there. Because I want to make noise. It echoes in my house. I want to make noise to drive home the point that all you lazy people in the house should be doing the dishes right now. Because I've been working all day long, and so I'm clanking dishes, and I'm scrubbing as hard and as loud as I can. Now, where's my heart in this? I don't think I'm serving with a very good heart. I'm trying to make a point here, and I kind of feel like a Martha in that moment. And my wife has come to me. Now, my intention is my kids, but sometimes it is my wife, too. I mean, I'm going to be honest. And she came to me and she goes, you know, sometimes I feel like you clank those dishes real loud to make a point that I should be doing them. And I've been like, oh, really? I, really? (laughs) And so I finally did admit to her one time, well, that's true. Sometimes I do do it for that that very reason. And so forgive me. Anyway, I'm a sinner, okay? Um, So that's the scene right here. Serving Jesus and other people isn't wrong, you guys. But when we mix up our priorities, there can be natural consequences to that. And oftentimes, the consequences are going to be relational fallout. That's what's going to happen. And and our motives can be wrong for serving. And our genuine care for people can be wrong, even in our service for Jesus and others. Now, I want you to observe with me four negative attitudes that Martha developed being more interested in duty rather than discipleship, okay? And we're going to look at each one fairly quickly here. Number one in your notes is a concerned attitude. Her concern over Mary's irresponsible behavior had led to an inaccurate assumption about Jesus, really in the fact that he wasn't caring about all the things that she was doing. And here's what I want you to understand when you get this mixed up. This is something that may happen to you is you become concerned about the wrong things. That's what happens. And you you may be saying, why are you sharing this with us? What does this have to do with evangelism? Listen to me very carefully. This is Satan's playground. Welcome. It's all masked in light, but welcome. And when you come, I hope you're prayed up. I hope you're studied up and all of these things. But don't think that he looks at that and goes, well, my work is done here because do you not think he doesn't want to attack your attitude? You better believe it. Some of the worst infighting I've ever dealt with as a pastor is on a missions trip in Uganda. We had a disciplined members on our team for infighting. Nasty, ugly. Don't think it doesn't happen. Don't think that Satan's not wanting to do that right here, right now with you guys. And so very, very important because we can get really mixed up and we become concerned about the wrong things. You see, she assumed that he didn't care about all the work that she was doing. That's not true. Consequently, she became unnecessarily worried. And according to God's word, when we worry, what is that called? Anybody know? Sin. Sin against God, and then sometimes we sin against other people. And the last thing we will worry about when our heart is in a right place with God is doing ministry to please other people. And in a sense, this was kind of rising to the surface. Number two, we have a complaining attitude. 
It says in Philippians to do all things without grumbling or disputing. I thought to myself, well, that's a good challenge for today, this week, month, year in life, right? Don't complain. God doesn't leave much room for grumbling when he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? Well, because your wrong heart motives are revealed when you begin to complain. And sometimes when we have our relationship mixed up and we are much more about duty than discipleship, these kind of things can rise to the surface. And when we complain, I found for myself, I lack faith. And when you lack faith on a missions trip, that's going to dictate some things as well. When we complain, we tend to try and take matters into our own hands. All of a sudden, we're on the throne. We're trying to manipulate and do different things. And we cast Jesus actually aside. The third attitude is a comparing attitude. Pride is the thing that drives comparison. And when we compare down, which I don't think a lot of people do, we are comparing out of pride. When we compare up, which is more normal, we usually throw some sort of a, you know, a pity party for ourselves. And we lack in the, we lack in trust in the sovereignty of God. And so we have to be careful. We have to be careful. And then number four attitude is a confrontational attitude. She says, then tell her to help me. Wow. I, you guys ever read a story about Jesus and go, I wonder what was his face was looking like right there. Like when I read that portion, you know, she's going off. And then you tell her to help me kind of a deal. I just would love to see Jesus' face on that one. I mean, I wonder if he's kind of half smiling like, I can tell her what to do. Yeah, I can do that. I mean, or was he just like, whoa, like what is all this about? You know, I don't know what he was doing. (laughs) Disciples looking at the, I mean, I don't know what was going on here. I just thought to myself, I can just feel the love right there in that moment. Yeah, not a whole lot of spiritual fruit shining through such gentleness and self-control. And we can have a confrontational attitude. Notice she didn't ask Jesus here. She demanded Jesus to tell her to get to work. I mean, that's an awkward situation, you guys, awkward. And there are moments, if we are not careful, in the flesh, we can create a whole lot of drama. My prayer for you is the only drama that you have is in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel divides. As it divides, drama is inevitable. I I know because I lived here for 15 years. You can ask any of my kids who grew up going to the public school in Utah about the gospel dividing. My kids were rejected over and over and over again. All five walked with Jesus Christ today by God's grace. Amen. Amen, right? But they were absolutely rejected every single year of school. In fact, my 18-year-old who went to boot camp yesterday, he said, Dad, pray for me that for the first time in my life, I have a real Christian friend. Because I have never had one. Not someone who's just poured themselves into me, where it's, it's back and forth. And yet my kids, despite that rejection, walk with Jesus. My kids didn't have a big old youth group. You know, those kinds of things that I had in California. My kids have sacrificed a lot. And you know, we've done our complaining and our comparing and those different things when we get all fleshed out. But I'll tell you what, they understand what the gospel does and yet they're willing to sacrifice for Jesus because he sacrificed ultimately for them. Martha was acting as though Jesus was absolutely ignoring her duties and didn't care about her efforts at all. And I don't believe that's the case here. I think Martha is revealing clear signs of anger. I mean, I don't think it was just this situation is my point. That's why it's so important to walk with Jesus, you guys, every day relationally. Otherwise, we begin to stuff stuff. In the very least, I believe she's being cynical. I think there's a lot of anger here. What a shame when here's a great opportunity to sit with Jesus instead of serving him. I think Jesus would have loved that. But here is Martha trying to serve Jesus, and yet is completely sinning because of a wrong perspective, wrong attitude, and so it's getting her into some trouble. In your notes there, this ministry is more about the person of Christ than it is about professionalism for Christ. And sometimes in the church we can get that mixed up. Ministry is more about the person of Christ than it is about the professionalism for Christ. Ministry, you guys, is not about big buildings. It's not about big youth groups. 
It's not about even big evangelism outreaches necessarily. What comes first is Jesus wants to be known. He wants to reveal his heart to you. When he reveals his heart to you day by day, you can go out as a heart revealer, as his representative, and do the things that he has called you to do. Ministry is not all about my next list of things to do for Jesus and list of things not to do. First and foremost, ministry is about a relationship with Jesus Christ that moves us into a proper relationship with other people. And if there's anything that I want to, I feel like God has laid on my heart to share with you before this whole week unfolds is just to warn you about that and to remind you of that at the same time. All right, verses 41 and 42. Man, yesterday it was 121 in Vegas. It feels like it's hotter up here right now. I'm sweating all over the place. Sorry I got that on film, but that's the truth. All right, verses 41 and 42. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are necessary. Really, only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Wow. I love this answer. Proverbs 15, 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, I don't know how Jesus, inflection-wise, really responded to that, but I can say that Jesus, and the person that I know, he has great compassion. And no offense, Martha didn't need any help and looking like a complete fool in this situation. And so I believe Jesus actually had great compassion. And what Jesus is about to say is, I think is so monumentally important. And he begins by getting her attention to get her out of her funk. And he does that, I believe, by saying her name twice. Have your parents ever said your name twice? Or how about this, your first and middle and last name all in the same sentence? I hated that anytime I heard my parents go, Derek Donald Smothers. You know, don't say my middle name, Mom. Please don't say my middle name. It always meant something and to get my attention. But I believe, like I said, with compassion, more than consternation or contempt, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, to get her attention. And he gently rebukes Martha because she hasn't yet discovered the greater purpose and that he wants her devotion to him first before all these other things. So, with that in mind, why is being with Jesus more important than doing for Jesus? Three things in your notes before we we end our time together. Number one, consider these things. Spending time with Jesus through his word helps us make precise decisions, maintain priorities, and passionately serve with proper motives. I'll say it again. Spending time with Jesus through his word helps us make precise decisions, maintain priorities, and passionately serve with proper motives. When you spend time with Jesus to go out and share the gospel today, and you hear from him when you're still, and you know most assuredly that he is God and the gospel is true, and you allow him to speak to you about the conversations you're going to have, and all of that. That's what it does when you spend time with Jesus. Secondly, spending time with Jesus through his word gives us a proper perspective on our daily pressures. When you spend time with Jesus, even if you hit something during the day that you didn't anticipate, that at first you're like, well, I didn't see that coming, it will decrease your stress and increase your faith. That's what it's going to do because... You spend time with Jesus. It's okay. But if you just got up and you're just all about hitting the business and just doing, I'm going to give them the gospel and I'm just going to keep on plowing through and you haven't spent time with Jesus, don't be, you know, surprised when Satan throws that curveball that you weren't ready for. Now, baseball is by far my favorite game. No offense to SoCal. I hate the Dodgers because I'm a Giants fan all the way. I'm from NorCal. Where's the love? Where's the love? No love. No love. I, my, I hate the Cubs. Anyway, uh, my favorite. No, sorry. Wow, wow. A lot of love from the body of Christ. All right. Hey, listen. One of my favorite things to watch in all of life, outside of ministry, of course, is when a Dodger takes a curveball looking, not swinging. For me, it's a great joy. 
I will go all the way down to LA and watch a game just to watch that happen. I will pay big money just to watch that happen. And they're not anticipating it. They're not expecting it. And it happens. Especially when, when, when Mad Bum's on the, on the mound. Anyway, get off of baseball for a second. But here's the thing I want you to understand. You, when you spend time with Jesus, he's going to give you proper perspective when things don't go as planned. And you guys already know this on a missions trip. Things don't ever go as planned. Ever. How many missions trips have I known where the van is pulled over and there's a flat tire? Somebody gets deathly sick. My wife has been deathly sick in Uganda twice. One time the team was going to leave without us and keep us in the hospital at Kampala. I wasn't looking forward to that. But we snuck her on the plane uh, avoiding the officials. Maybe that wasn't right, but that's what we did. Anyway. (laughs) But you can't anticipate. And you know what? God doesn't want you to anticipate because like I said, if you spend time with him, he will decrease your stress. He will increase your faith because he knows that there's a real enemy who wants to discourage your faith but he wants you to rely upon him. Thirdly, spending time with Jesus through his word helps us pursue the eternal and not prefer the temporal. Now, I got to be careful about how I say this and I want to say it well. And I'm trying to figure out how to say it. I've prayed about it. I'll give you a real quick story. There's a massive megachurch from Syracuse, New York that came out in about 1995 that did a VBS for our church over in Linden called Fellowship Bible Church. He put on a sports camp. And as the youth pastor said, he brought his top 100 youth to do this sports camp for us. I mean, it was huge. I mean, we had all these different sports that they, they did, and there was tons of money that came in for this missions trip. I mean, they drove buses and vans from Syracuse, New York to Linden, Utah. That's a long ways, you guys. Lots of money. And I'll, I will never forget for the rest of my life how disappointed, listen, how disappointed he was that there were only like three or four kids that received Christ that week. And he said to me, listen, I'm ashamed to go back to my church. I'm ashamed to go back to my church and tell them that only three or four kids trusted Jesus Christ this week. And I thought, heaven so help me, where we get to this situation where we're disappointed that three or four kids out of religion found Jesus Christ by relationship for the first time in their life. You know, party, or the party's going on in heaven, but apparently it's not happening down here on earth. We were overjoyed as pastors. Like, that's the most success that we had seen in all of my years. I was stoked. I was so super stoked. And then he made that comment. I was like, huh? Like, what was that about? And it really got me thinking. Sometimes, you guys, does Jesus, Jesus is sovereign, man. He is in control. His loving kindness pursues the lost. He will use us. He won't use us. He does whatever he wants to do. But here's the thing I want you to know. God wants your heart. And it'd be like this. I was sharing this with Aaron. Aaron had to leave. But I said this. Aaron, it would be like this. It would be like my kids coming from wherever they come, on vacation, coming to my home, to see my wife and I, and the entire time they clean the house, they wash my car, they make my bed, they finally freaking do the dishes. And then they leave and they didn't spend any time with me. I said, Aaron, that would break my heart. That would break my heart. Jesus does not want you guys to go on a missions trip and do all this stuff for him and not spend any time with him. It would break his heart. Now, God's grace and God's power is far above. I mean, he's sovereign. He can still use you. He can do whatever he wants to do. He can still save people. But listen very carefully. Jesus loves you and wants to spend time with you. He wants to reveal his heart to you. Be still and know that he is God so that you can represent him in the way that he wants to be represented. So these attitudes don't flare up. In your notes there, when it comes to ministering for Christ... We need to make sure that our priorities align with his purpose for service. And we can only do that by getting to know him through his word, by the leading of his spirit. And by the way, thank you, worship team. Thank you, worship team, for allowing me to worship today. Thank you so much. 
I enjoyed every song. I'm freaking tired. I don't want to sound like a complainer, but I am tired. But I was so energized by the worship this morning. So thank you for entering us into the throne of Jesus through the worship this morning. But you guys, I want you to hear the heart of Jesus. He does not want you here to do all this stuff, to go back and tell whatever stories you tell, and then to not have spent any time with him. It just makes no sense. So in conclusion and application, I want to look at a few consequences if you move that way, and a few commendations if you move the way that God wants you to. Number one consequence is this. Your sinful attitude will ruin your fellowship with Christ and others. This was not a party once Martha threw her attitude. And, and believe it or not, even on a missions trip, you can ruin fellowship. Like I said, I've seen people disciplined on a missions trip before. Number two consequence, if you're not careful, Jesus might gently rebuke you like he did with Martha. I don't know what that would look like personally, but it can happen, I believe. Number three, if you're not careful, and I can speak to this, you will run spiritually dry at some point, and if you're not careful, you might burn out. You might actually despise the very duties that you ended up loving. And here's my sin. I'll, I'll tell you my sin in ministry. My sin was this, and, and by God's Spirit, through my counseling, this was pointed out to me, and it was very humbling. So here it is. I loved the church more than I loved Jesus. That's the best way to break it down. I dedicated my whole life. I left a successful family business, went into ministry, yippity dee, look at me. And I, I began to have a love affair with the church more than Jesus. And Jesus said, that's fine. You go ahead. You go on that path for a while. See how you end up. And you know how I ended up? Three and a half years ago, I ended up in bed Outside of Vegas, I could barely get out of bed and make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for my kids. That's where I ended up. I ended up saying, I don't know if I ever want to go back to church again. I ended up saying, Lord, who are you really? And Jesus is like, man, I've been trying to get your attention for years. Thanks for all the stuff you did, Derek. But my heart's been bleeding, wanting to know you more, wanting you to know me more. And God stripped me literally of every ministry responsibility, plopped me in near Vegas, Nevada. I have never wanted to live near Vegas, Nevada. Never. And you know what? It's the very place that God restored me, refreshed me, and in years, walking with Jesus in a whole new way. There it is. Consequence number four, you will eventually resign from any or quite possibly all ministry. And what I found for me is God ended up giving me so much ministry. So that's what you want? I'm just spoon feed you till you barf. That's what happened. I don't want that for you. So commendation. Let's get to some encouragement. Derek, where's the encouragement? All right, number one, commendation number one. God will bless you when you sacrifice worldly responsibilities for spiritual securities. Meaning this, it's not always about the numbers kind of worldly in our thinking. Sacrifice those things for spiritual securities in knowing Jesus. Number two, there are many good things to be done. Many, many good things to be done. But Jesus makes it clear the best way to get good things done in the right way is to first sit at his feet and learn of him. Learn of him. What an amazing thing that God I mean, time, I believe you guys, as I get older, time is the greatest gift that you can give someone. I mean, everybody likes money. I had to go shopping with my 16-year-old daughter yesterday in Vegas. Four and a half hours of shopping for clothes. And we barely bought anything in four and a half hours. But I love my daughter. And so we had coffee. We laughed. We did a lot of crying because my son went off to boot camp. We spent time together, and we shopped clothes. So, it's good. We sat with each other. Number three, we display our love and obedience to God when we seek discipleship before duty. Let me be clear. Being never negates our responsibility of doing. That's not what I'm talking about, but there is a proper priority. And so in your notes there, I have this quote. Our contributions 
Our contributions will take us only as far as our character will take us. And our character is developed when we spend time with Jesus. That's what happens there. All right, so here's my really stupid illustration. Scale. Scale. Very good. This is my son's scale. Like, really, how does he stand on that thing? Yeah, really. My 18-year-old who shipped off to boot camp, this was his scale over the last year. Over the last year, my son has lost nearly 100 pounds. And he didn't stand on that. He weighed every single plate that he ate. His discipline was absolutely incredible. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be really honest. I hated this scale for a long time. I hated it because he was so disciplined all the time. But here's what God began to do in my heart. Because oftentimes when you sit down around food with people, what do you do? You talk. You talk. And so every meal, he didn't eat with his family. He had his own meal, but he ate with us. Does that make sense? So he'd do his own cooking and everything. But what I found was around this scale presented the opportunity to know my son in an intimate way. His thoughts, what he loves, what he hates. He loves politics. I won't tell you all what he loves, but he loves politics. loves a lot of things. He loves his country. And it's the thing now when I look at it, it's a a very good thing. And it reminds me of my relationship. And I want to use this as an illustration of the word. And that is this. This is a tool that you're going to use to share the gospel. Whether it's electronically or by this right here. But more than anything else, if we're going to talk about proper priority, it should be the thing that we look at and we say, you know what? You know why I love God's word? Because it reveals God's heart. It allows me to get to know his thoughts. It allows me to become more like Jesus when I just rest in him and I meditate and I pray and I spend time with Jesus in and through his word. Lord, would you fill me today because I spent time with you. So like this scale reminds me of of relationship building with my son, I want God's word to be more than just a tool that you use to get the gospel out, but it's the very thing that God uses in your life to reveal his heart for you to get to know him. So that's my challenge to you. I am so thankful that you are here. I have the privilege of being on the board of Tri-Grace Ministries. We pray for all the teams that come out every year, and we are so behind what God is doing. But we want you to remember how important it is to sit at the feet of Jesus before you serve. Would you stand with me, and I'll pray and end our time together. Let me pray for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice that he made, Lord, for us on the cross. We're thankful for the forgiveness that you've offered through Jesus. We're thankful, Lord, that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Lord, we're thankful that we can be ambassadors for you in this area and that we can proclaim the true gospel, Lord, the gospel that saves us by your grace through faith. Lord, I want to pray for every single missionary that's here today. Lord, remind them of your heart for them. Remind them of of what you have sacrificed for them, and that is to be in relationship with them as you desire for those that they seek to converse with today. But Lord, help them also to remember in all the distracted duties that we can involve ourselves in, Lord, that ultimately you want to spend time with us. You want to reveal your heart to us, and your heart is certainly for the lost, but Lord, your heart is also to grow in relationship with us. And so, Lord, We appreciate Martha's dedication. We appreciate Martha's passion. And Lord, we also appreciate Mary who sat at your feet. May we consider these things today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.